Hey, how's it going folks? Welcome to Found Flix. On this ending explain, we'll be looking at the recent update of the classic universal monster, the Invisible Man. Following a crazed scientist who uses his power to become invisible to stalk and terrorize his ex. Yet when no one believes her, she decides to take matters into her own hands and fight back. It's honestly shocking how much difficulty Universal has had in the past few years when it comes to new takes on their roster of classic monsters. They had grand ambitions of a shared monster universe, which isn't a bad concept, yet each of the entries crashed and bombed hard, starting with Dracula Untold. Sure, let's put Dracula in Game of Thrones, that was about it. And then there was The Mummy with Tom Cruise that only had flashes of horror, going instead for a much more bombastic and high-budget action spectacle. In both cases, missing the mark pretty hard. And the monster cinematic universe was dead before it even got started. Fortunately, with The Invisible Man, they finally figured out what to do. Enlist the Blumhouse formula, reduce the budget to nine million bucks, so it's much lower lower stakes financially and really hone in on the horror aspects of the story rather than making it an afterthought and get a well-regarded successful genre director with Lee Whannell who has been kicking around for years writing and co-starring in Saw along with writing the Insidious series and recently made his first writer-director debut with the vehicle upgrade. Impressively The Invisible Man is by far his most successful film to date and excels in every aspect from the actually amazing soundtrack full of Inception style blustering soundscapes to the directing and camera work, always panning to empty corners and chairs, making us think something might be waiting there we can't see. It's very effective, making literally an empty frame somehow terrifying. Along with an as expected wonderful performance from the paranoia fueled Elizabeth Moss, every part of the movie works flawlessly together to make an excellent modern updated take on The Invisible Man, and is so far my favorite mainstream horror film of the year, at least until something else comes out. So at least Universal did eventually figure out how to do their classic character justice, and there are quite a few twists and turns to the story, in particular near the end that makes things a bit complicated and ultimately leaves us not exactly sure where things land after the story unfolds. So we'll be looking in depth at the story, a few interesting easter eggs in there, along with breaking down the mini twist and explaining the ending and how it relates to Cecilia's entire character arc. The completely dialogue free opening sequence starts things off on a brilliantly unsettling foot, and is also able to inform us of a ton with without saying a word. Cecilia wakes up, and immediately based on her demeanor and behavior, we can see just how scared she is, which makes sense as she is enacting a plan to escape her boyfriend Adrian's grasp. She carefully gets out of bed, retrieving a bottle of diazepam, which she used to drug him, disposing of the evidence in the sink. In the closet, she retrieves a duffel bag of supplies hidden in a vent in the wall, and uses a ladder to turn a camera to keep an eye on Adrian. Wow, she has definitely put a lot of thought into this plan. Sure is elaborate. She descends down into his Iron Man style laboratory to cut all the security camera feeds and disable the alarm. Also here seeing a few odd black suits on display, which we will come to find out is a pretty important bit of foreshadowing. Those are the uh, invisible suits, yep. Still on the edge, C tiptoes back through the house into the garage, on the verge of freedom! Though she stopped by their dog Zeus and apologizes for not being able to take him along, but feels guilty when seeing the shock collar Adrian makes him wear, spending precious seconds to remove it from the poor pooch, and in doing so, accidentally hits a fancy sports car setting off the alarm, and sending her into high gear to get away, climbing over some concrete barricades to a rural road, seeing lights coming on back in the house, meaning Adrian's not too far behind, and I got a feeling he's gonna be pissed off. She's further distressed, as her ride isn't there yet, and keeps peering back through the woods for a sign of Adrian. Luckily, her sister Emily shows up to her relief, demanding for her to drive, and dropping the diazepam bottle when getting in. Emily is confused by everything going on here, trying to get some answers from C, but there's no time. An enraged Adrian appears, yelling for her to open the door and punches through the window, chasing after the car as they speed away in the night. Dang! So now we already get how much of a threat Adrian actually is. As well as being violent and emotionally unhinged, even without much context, we 100% already understand why C would want to get the heck out of there. Even though she did manage to escape, when we pick up two weeks later, she is now in a constant state of fear, to the extent of making her housebound, too frightened to even step outside due to the possibility of Adrian tracking her down. Staying with a cop friend of her sister James and his daughter Sydney, he encourages her to try again and go get the mail, which proves to be more difficult and traumatic than even imaginable, making it only a few precious steps outside before a jogger passes by, sending her hightailing it back indoors. She becomes increasingly paranoid, googling articles about how to know if you're being watched and blotting out her webcam camera 
ends, even getting tense when the doorbell rings. It's just Emily, yet C is still terrified, having warned her to not come here, worried that Adrian will follow her and not letting her get a word in edgewise. She finally is able to reveal her earth-shattering news to C, that Adrian has died, showing her an article detailing that he committed suicide. Emily is happy with the news, now C doesn't have to cut her out of her life anymore. But C is too taken aback, and seems even unable to comprehend the idea that Adrian truly is gone. Based on her earlier comments, Emily hasn't been in contact with her sister for some time, and has no idea what she went through in her relationship with Adrian, which C opens up about, mostly having to do with controlling every facet of her life, from what she wore or ate, and even what she said and where she went. This also included physical abuse, but even more alarmingly, he wanted a baby. And she knew that if she got pregnant, she would never be able to get away. So she started taking birth control without him knowing, but also realized that this could only go on for so long, leading to her daring escape we saw at the beginning. Emily promises that she's safe now and that they're here for her, which gives C a much needed boost of confidence, taking another trip outside, and this time even picking up the mail. Hooray! Although the victory is short-lived. James finding that one of the pieces of mail is for her, despite no one knowing she is staying there. It's related to Adrian's trust, and she and Emily pay a visit to his lawyer brother Tom, who is in charge of executing Adrian's final wishes. Tom begins to read a heavy-handed letter that lays the blame on C, which Emily quickly puts a stop to. And as it turns out, C is in for a massive payday, to the tune of five million buccaronis thanks to Adrian. Of course, there are some stipulations, like not being able to commit a crime, but but that shouldn't be too much of a problem for her. And she signs the papers that will change her life. She first pays it back to James and Sydney, buying them a fancy new ladder and setting up an account for Sydney to go to fashion school. And here we see a totally different, happy and carefree side to C's personality that has been pushed under Adrian's control for so long. And she's finally starting to blossom out of that painful situation that consumed her for years. Naturally, things won't be so easy as she again becomes worried that someone is following her. After well deserved shopping trip, she feels that someone is in the room with her, hearing some faint, odd clicking and whirring sounds, yet no one appears to be there. But it becomes more obvious there is. The next morning when cooking breakfast, she leaves the stove unattended for a moment and returns to the heat having been cranked up, causing a fire, which they put out and laugh off. But it's only the beginning of her strange visitations, that night hearing the door creaking open, along with footsteps and the same soft, rapid clicking. The house in total silence, she slowly searches the halls, hearing distant footsteps in the living room, but no sign of anything amiss, until hearing the front door open on its own. She steps out looking around the neighborhood, appearing alone, but definitely is not. The breath of someone behind her lingering in the air undetected. The invisible man makes their presence more known, pulling off the sheets while she sleeps and snaps some photos of her, which stirs her awake. She's frightened by a silhouette at the foot of the bed, but it's just an outfit. Well, not just any outfit, but the same one worn by the original Invisible Man way back in the 30s. Nice Easter egg there. She grabs the sheet, clearly seeing the outline of footprints in the fabric. They walk closer and pull the sheet away from her, see yelling for James, certain that someone was in there, but of course there's no evidence of this, which begins to make it seem like the whole situation is actually causing her to go a little bonkers. James tries to console her, telling her to not let Adrian haunt you, as he will if she lets him, though things only get more severe. During a job interview, C finds that her portfolio is empty, someone having removed all the drawings, and suddenly starts feeling ill. Things getting blurry, and she passes out on the floor. And afterwards, getting checked out at the hospital, through a blood test, learns that it was a large dose of diazepam in her system that caused her to lose consciousness. But C doesn't remember taking any, and she's shocked to see a bottle of it sitting there on her sink, the same exact one that she dropped when escaping Adrian's. And she's becoming more convinced that he is actually still alive, returning to Tom's and telling him to put a stop to it. He's of course like, what do you mean he's totally dead? And she recalls just how far that he was willing to go to keep her in the relationship, warning that if she ever did leave, wherever she went, he would find her. He would walk right up to her without her even knowing, but would leave a sign so that she would know that he was there, pulling out the bottle of pills to prove her point, and believes that he must have found a way to become invisible, as he was a groundbreaking scientist in the field of optics. Tom is steadfast that he's gone, although agrees that he was brilliant, not in his work, but in his ability to get into people's heads and prey on their weaknesses. Even here, he says, he came up with the perfect way to torture her in death, letting her think he did find a way to become invisible without actually doing it 
sending her paranoia into overdrive, effectively torturing her from beyond the grave. Man, this guy's twisted. He too admits that he hated his brother, chuckling that he was relieved when hearing that he was dead. And to double down on his point, produces a crime scene photo of Adrian, splayed out on the floor, blood all around his body, certainly looking quite dead there. So is he really dead and C is losing it? Or is this all an elaborate plan to make her look crazy? Paying a visit to Emily, she finds her quite agitated. An email supposedly sent by C calling her suffocating and wanting her out of her life. C has no idea about any email, believing that it has to have been Adrian. But Emily is sick of all this, telling her that she needs medication and slamming the door. To her surprise, when returning home and checking her laptop, the email did come from her account, still in the sent box, making it look like for all intents and purposes that she did send the damning email. Certain Adrian is responsible for everything and unable to do anything about it. She breaks down into a weeping ball on the floor. He's getting to her all over again. Sydney finds her still there later and trying to make her feel better, offers to have a girl's night and eat some cake to get her mind off of things, but no such luck. An invisible force punching Sydney in the face, her believing that it was C. But now we know better. The damage is still done regardless. James taking Sydney away for her safety, her pleading to James that this is what Adrian does, wanting him to think that she did it to get her isolated and more alone. Which worked. By herself, she goes him to come out and hit her instead of a little girl. She decides to try and call Adrian's cell phone and disturbingly hears it ringing from up above in the attic. Utilizing that fancy new ladder, she climbs into the dark space, calling his cell phone again, seeing it right across the floor from her. She unlocks it, finding the photos taken that night while asleep, along with a knife and a plastic bag, the same that fell in the kitchen back when she was cooking, and also a stack of all of her missing drawings. Then she gets a text on the phone, surprise, and she gets ready to defend herself, taking the knife and peering down to the floor below, seeing nothing there, but dumps a can of white paint down, exposing the outline of a strange black bodysuit, and now know with absolute certainty that someone has been utilizing this suit to terrorize her with its invisible powers. She hops down, the sink on and filled with white paint. Her assailant has washed it off, undetectable once again, and attacks her, grabbing her by the throat and slamming her against the wall. C doing her best to fight back against what she can't see, flung around the room and hitting him with dishes and anything that she can find. It does work to break their grasp. C able to get to the streets and call a lift ride. Boy, those are sure convenient. They're at four o'clock in the morning and there's a lift ride right around the corner. Uh, it's California for you though. She's almost totally foiled by the guy taking like a 15 point turn to get going and enlists him to drive her all the way to a Adrian's estate outside of the city. It's quite eerie there, especially with all the white sheets covering everything. And yet surprisingly, Zeus is still there and looking well. Hmm, how could he have been on his own for two weeks without being fed? Pretty suspicious. And makes it obvious that someone has still been spending some time here and puts her on edge of them still being here now. She returns to Adrian's lab, honing in on that display that she saw earlier and attempts to crack the code to get in. Thinking back to the first day that they met and putting that in as the password, which is correct blithely remarking, oh, how romantic. She sees a tablet on the wall showing what looks like something's POV, hearing those same consistent clicking sounds we've heard in every one of her invisible counters so far. Lo and behold, after pressing some buttons, the suit decloaks, revealing it's made up of innumerable tiny little cameras all around it, which allows it to distort the visual information around it to effectively become invisible. She removes the suit from its hooks, getting a warning bark from Zeus, informing her that she has a visitor, and returns to her hiding spot in the vent in the closet, hiding and looking through a crack in the door. It slides open on its own, seeing a foot imprint appear on the ground. She makes a break for it, getting caught by the invisible man, but thanks to an assist from Zeus, she is able to evade them and get back to her lift, calling her sister to meet her in a public place now that she has real proof of what's been going on here. At a trendy restaurant, she is relieved that her sister does decide to come, telling her that she loves her and praising her inner strength, which she especially needs now, begging her to believe what she's about to tell her. She starts to explain about finding the suit that Adrian built, but is interrupted by a knife seen floating next to her in the air, which slits her sister's throat, flying over to C's hand, all happening so quickly that she doesn't even grasp what just happened, staring in disbelief as Emily tragically bleeds out on the table, getting wrestled to the ground and arrested. Dang, this invisible dude is a real a-hole. She's lugged away to a mental hospital, which based on the actual evidence is making her look totally cuckoo again, yelling, I see you, when being dragged dragged into her room and sedated, fading away into unconsciousness. She hears Adrian's voice telling her surprise as she blacks out. Being questioned later, they go through her recent odd behavior. And again, looks like she's just been losing her mind rather than an invisible tormentor being responsible. Try 
trying to get real with James and feeling guilty for even getting her sister involved with Adrian because she would never do anything to hurt her. He too feels guilty for leaving her alone, believing that he failed her, yet still has no reason to believe her story of Adrian being alive at this point based on all the evidence. Taken back to her room, the nurse drops a bombshell, asking if C knew that she was pregnant. And based on her reaction, uh, no, I do not believe that she did. Also clarifying that it must have been sometime in the past month. C realizing that even then, her plans were being foiled by Adrian, which becomes abundantly clear in a revelatory meeting with Tom that flips everything so far on its head. He attempts some kind of compassion, calling her still family despite everything that's happened. But his purpose here is to stop C's payment. One of those stipulations being having to be of sound mind, which isn't looking so good for her at the moment. C doesn't let him get to her, saying she used to feel sorry for him being a blood relative of a sociopath, a punching bag handcuffed to Adrian's wallet, but says that she can now see him for who he really is, the jellyfish version of his brother. The exact same, but minus the spine. Ooh, burn! He suggests that she can go back to litigate the case at great expense or sign the document and forfeit the trust. Then the true game being played here is revealed, offering her one more option, agreeing to have the baby and go back to Adrian. What? So not only do we know for sure that Adrian is alive, but already knew about her pregnancy, divulging that of course Adrian knew about her taking birth control and replaced it with a placebo without her knowledge, warning he was always going to find her no matter what he had to do. The reason behind his absurd obsession is due to the fact that she doesn't need him, something the egomaniac Adrian has never experience before, and this is why he's punishing her for trying to leave. With the alternative being probably convicted of murdering her sister, she's still not interested, in frustration knocking the papers to the floor and grabbing a pen while he gathers them together. He leaves, but it does appear that Adrian was a silent witness in the meeting, see looking ominously over to a couch, and it seems certain that Adrian is there. She puts this theory to the test in an extreme way back in her room, taking the pen and jamming it into her arm, yelling that he'll never get to have the baby. An invisible force grabs her arm, stopping her, and she retaliates with the pen stabbing him repeatedly, which damages the suit, now erratically blinking to visibility and not. Plainly seen by an officer coming in, who winds up getting his taser turned back on him, which does allow C to get out of the room. More and more waves of officers show up to try and stop him, and his invisibility going in and out is able to take out the entire group one by one, hearing again what is unmistakably Adrian's voice saying bang, when pointing a gun to one's head and makes his exit, C grabbing a gun and chasing after. She spots him briefly in the parking lot but misses the shot. Coming to an SUV with the back open, he appears right in front of her and chokes her, again clearly talking in Adrian's voice. He demoralizes her for thinking that she's learning how to beat him and decides it's time to teach her a lesson about who's really in charge, threatening to take it out on someone that she cares about, meaning Sydney, informing James of what's going on and hijacking a car in a mad dash to beat Adrian there. Seeing our old friend Billy from the Saw films as graffiti on the fence there, also from Lee Winnell as mentioned earlier. He makes it to the house first, entering via the patio door into the dark and peaceful home, descending into Sydney's room. She's startled awake by his presence and not seeing anything, still goes for her mace and unleashes it upon him, hearing him groaning and slamming back into the dresser. She runs into the hall and gets clotheslined to the floor, importantly seeing here that there are two different people in invisible suits. Adrian in the room couldn't physically have somehow gotten in front of her that quickly, so the person that floors her is definitely someone else. Her dad makes it, wrestling with the invisible man, and once again, it's pretty tough to fight against what you can't see, getting his ass knocked out cold. C shows up right after, opening fire with an extinguisher, allowing her to see their assailant, and blows the man away. He starts to stumble towards her, but doesn't get too far, slumping to the ground dead. And when removing the mask, surprisingly, it's Tom underneath, which points at him being responsible this whole time, and looks pretty open and shut, when the cops raid Adrian's house and find him barricaded behind a wall, hands bound and looking like hell. As far as James and the law are concerned, Adrian was a victim of Tom's just like C was, but she knows better. If he could fake his own death, he could easily fake a kidnapping too. He encourages her to just go along with things, saying it's the easiest way to get her life back, but she doesn't want him to get off, believing Adrian did everything before and actually set his brother up, understanding that this is just another of Adrian's classic tricks making C think that she's the crazy one, which we have been seeing going on the entire movie. He asks her to just let it go, but after everything that she's been through, there's no way in hell that's happening, putting together her own plan, calling Adrian, and on the surface, making
making it seem like she's forgiven him and willing to even consider him being back in her life in any capacity, and decide on dinner at his place to discuss their future and that of their child. Adrian appears to be regretful, admitting that he didn't treat her as he should, and promises that he's learned his lesson. Yeah, right, you scumbag. She's more interested in starting things on a more honest foot, asking him to just admit to everything that he's actually been doing, including framing his brother. But he's steadfast that he's innocent and that it was all Tom's doing, even swearing this to be the truth. She starts to sob, knowing for sure now that he's incapable of ever truly being honest with her. And he attempts to console her, knowing that sometimes she feels like she's going crazy, which you actually are entirely at fault for, but okay, as he knows her better than anyone else. And seeing just how much of a shit he really is, says that shouldn't come as much of a surprise, really emphasizing the word, which of course backs up C's version of the story, going all the way back to that surprise message that she got at James's in the attic making it abundantly clear now that Adrian was the true mastermind here, and everything was spurned on by C leaving to make her lose everything in her life and drive her back to him. Again, due to no one else ever having left him before, he refused to let this happen and really went to some extreme lengths to do so, even letting his brother take the rap and get killed and killing Emily as well. I mean, this guy is a full on psycho. That moment where Cindy is attacked makes this thing make more sense, that it really was Adrian in the suit until this this time, and since we realize there are two suits and he does have even more at home, one is worn by him here and the other by his brother, giving him plenty of opportunity to sneak out of James's house and be waiting in the walls when the cops arrive, executing his whole plan with his ill-fated bro taking the fall. Speaking of suits, there's that one that she stashed the last time that she was here, excusing herself to the bathroom and knowing that she has no other choice in putting a stop to Adrian once and for all. He sits there alone, staring at her empty chair then lifting up his steak knife and slitting his own throat. That's what it looks like at least, but when C comes in and fake shock for the camera when calling the police, we know that she donned the suit and did the deed herself, finally putting her in control of their dynamic using Adrian's own invisible tricks against him. Ha, showed you, sucker. He gets this too while bleeding out on the floor. C leaning down and telling him surprise as he flutters away to death. James, who is listening nearby, comes running to the scene, a calm C informing him that he killed himself. James is no dummy either, asking if she was really trying to get him to confess on tape. She says she did, and I actually believe this as well. She gave him a huge opportunity to come clean, but he refused to do so and continued to mess with C. And this is why she kills him, knowing he was always going to be torturing her for the rest of her days, and finally has had enough of his attempts to control everything in her life, seizing control for herself for the first time, and leaves newly emboldened and self-assured, knowing that she can finally put this ordeal behind her and really start living her life on her own again, one free of the absolutely batshit nuts Adrian. I mean, seriously, you built a suit that can make you invisible, and his best use of it is torturing his ex-girlfriend and creating this entire like crazy elaborate scenario, dude's got some serious issues, that is for sure. With that, we have reached the conclusion of this ending explained for The Invisible Man. Again, at least Universal eventually figured out how to do a good modern take on their classic characters, and that's a triumph in and of itself. And Lee Whannell is increasingly showing his deft hand as a horror director and writer that shows us that there will be much to look forward from him in the future. As far as the future of the Universal monsters, hopefully they will learn what made this work and not stray too far away from the core concepts that made people like the monsters in the first place. And there is already another new version in the works, and perhaps unsurprisingly, it's a new take on Dracula, but with Karen Kusama helming it, who is known for The Invitation and Jennifer's Body. So I'm hoping that her version will add something new to the many times adapted vampire story, and will allow Universal to keep up the positive momentum to allow us to get some, you know, actually good new versions of our classic favorite monsters. Fingers crossed. What did you guys think of The Invisible Man and its ending? Which classic Universal monster is your favorite? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.